What exactly is it that makes a poem different? For example, it's a piece of prose or even song lyrics. The truth is that when we get down to poetry, isn't all that easy to pin down. Even poets themselves disagree about what constitutes a poem. What chance then do our struggling students have? Luckily, there are some broad, general characteristics that can be agreed upon. So in this lesson, we will look at these common features of poetry and how we can best instill an understanding of this in our students. So welcome to lesson 2, Poetry and its Forms. Of all forms professional writers can take, it is the professional poet who most often finds himself herself struggling to make ends meet financially. Poetry can be difficult to understand and require a lot of effort on part of the reader. Students can be forgiven for what wondering what exactly is the point of this difficult to write and difficult to read the genre that is apparently used to torture the less literally minded during their school years. It may be a hard sell to some of our more reluctant readers, but there's a point behind all of these words of misery. Poetry's purpose is essential to help us understand the world around us. It endeavors to show the things anew that we may have previously taken for granted. It offers us new perspective on the familiar. Poetry's purpose is to enable us to see the world with fresh eyes again, like those of a child. In doing this, it helps us understand our world in a deeper way. Let's talk about the common features of poetry. First, it looks like a poem. If it looks like a poem and it reads like a poem, then the chances are pretty good that it is indeed a poem. Poetry comes in lines, some of which are full sentences, but many of which are not. Also, usually, these lines don't run out to the more just consistently, like in, say, a novel. All this gives poetry a distinctive and recognizable look on the page. It often has some underlying form holding things together. While this isn't always true in some free verse, for example, a lot of poetry conforms to prescribed structures such as in sonnet, haiku, etc. Lastly, it uses imagery. If the poet is worth his or her salt, they'll endeavor to create images in the reader's mind using lots of sensory details and figurative languages. Let's move on to the structures of poetry. We've mentioned already that though poetry's origins lie in the spoken word, it does take a very recognizable shape when put down on the page. This is largely due to the overall organization of the lines on the page, often in the form of stanzas. So when we say stanza, stanzas are basically the poetic equivalent of a prose paragraph. They are a series of lines that are grouped together and separated from other groups of lines or stanzas by a skipped line. So stanzas come in a variety of lengths dependent either on the whim of poet or the conventions of a particular poetic form. There is a variety of technical vocabulary often used to refer to stanzas of specific lengths. Here are the most common of these stanzas of two lines are called couplet, three lines are called tercet, four lines are called quatrain, five lines are called sequin, Six lines are called sestet or occasionally a sexine. Seven lines are called a septet. And eight lines are called an octave. Another structure of a poem is form. Form is the appearance of the words on the page. And poem also has line. Line is a group of words together on one line of the poem. And these are the types of poetry and their characteristics. There are many different types of poetry, some of which we'll look at below. But regardless of the specific type of poetry in question, most likely a poem will fit into one of these three overaching types of poetry. 
lyric, narrative, and descriptive. Lyric poetry. Lyric poetry concerns itself largely with emotional life of the poet. That it that is, it's written in their voice and expresses strong thoughts and emotion. There is only one voice in a lyric poem, and we see the world from that single perspective. Most modern poetry is lyric poetry, and that is personal and introspective. Narrative poetry. As its name implies, narrative poetry is concerned with storytelling. Just in a prose story, a narrative poem will most likely follow the conventions of plot including elements such as conflict, rising action, climax, resolution, etc. Again, as in prose stories, narrative poems will most likely be peopled with characters to perform the actions of the tale. Descriptive Poetry Descriptive poetry usually employs lots of rich imagery to describe the world around the poet. While it most often has a single poetic voice and a strong emotional content, descriptive poetry differs from lyric poetry in that its focus is more on the externalities of the world rather than the interior life of the poet. We have mentioned that poetry often hangs on the conventions of specific underlying structures. Let's now take a look at the some of the more common of these subtypes and their defining characteristics. Sonnet Sonnets are predominantly concerned with matters of the heart. If you see a sonnet recognizably blocky form on a page, there's a good chance the theme will be love. There are two common forms of the sonnet. We have the Petrarchan and the Shakespearean sonnet. They differ slightly in their internal structure, but both of them have 14 lines. Let's take a look at some of more of the internal characteristics of both forms. Petrarchan has comprises two stanzas. First eight lines pose a question. Second stanza answers the question posed. And it has a rhyme scheme of A B B A A B B A C D E C D E, while Shakespearean sonnet comprises of three quatrains of four lines each, ends with a rhyming couplet which forms a conclusion, and the rhyme scheme is A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. The haiku is a disciplined form of poetry that has its origins in 17th century Japanese poetry. Usually, it is concerned with nature and natural phenomena such as the seasons, weather, etc. They are often quite meditative in tone. However, there are no real rules regarding themes. The only real demands here relate to the structure. They are written in three line stanzas. First line contains five syllables, second line contains seven syllables, third line contains five syllables. Due to their short length and limited requirements, these are usually a lot of fun for students to write. They can serve as a great introduction for students to attempt to write poetry according to specific technical requirements of a form. LAG Elegies are a type of poem that doesn't really come with specific structural requirements but still constitute a recognizable form of poetry. What makes an elegy an elegy is its subject, that is, death. Elegies are poems of lamentation. The word elegy itself comes from the Greek word elegia, which means to lament. A poem of reflection and death or someone who has died usually comes in three parts expressing loss, grief, praise for the deceased, and finally, consolation. Limerick Favorites of school children everywhere, the most defining characteristic of limericks are their renowned humor. Given their well-deserved reputation for being funny and on occasion crude, it's easy to overlook the fact that beneath the lobs lie quite a tightly structured verse form. 
So it has five lines in total, distinct verbal rhythm, two longer lines of usually between seven to ten syllables, two shorter lines of usually between five to seven syllables, one closing line containing the punch line, and the rhyme scheme is A A B B A. Next is ballad. Ballads are a type of narrative poetry that have close ties to musical forms. Ballads written as poetry can often easily be adapted as song lyrics. While ballads don't have tight formal construction like some other forms of poetry, there are enough way of distinguishing features to identify it as a form. Ballad tells a story often using simple language. It's, it talks about romantic, adventurous, or humorous. It is arranged in groups of four lines or quatrains, often uses alternating four and three beat lines, and the ry rhyme scheme is usually A, B, A, B, or A, B, C, B. Odd. Another poetry form that traces its origin to ancient Greece Odds were originally intended to be sung. Nowadays, though no longer sung, the term odds still refers to a type of lyric poem that addresses and often praises a certain person, thing, or event. The author addresses a person, thing, or event, usually has a solemn, sturgish tone, explores universal elements of the theme, Powerful emotional element often involving catharsis. Odds written in the classical vein can follow very strict metrical patterns and rhyme schemes. However, many modern odds are written in free verse involving irregular rhythm and without adherence to a rhyme scheme. Epic these are long narrative poems that recount heroic tales, usually focus on legendary or mythical figure. Think of works of literature on a grand scale such as the Odyssey, the Cattle Raid of Coley or Beowulf. In Epic, it employs an objective and omniscient narrator, written in an elevated style, recounts heroic events, and it is in grand in scale. So that would be all, thank you.